All right, the first full length free practice one USMLE exam. We're gonna go through the whole thing one block at a time. You could find this, by the way, at zap70.com, which is currently under production as I continue to optimize its performance and upload thousands of questions, which I'm gonna do for steps one, two, and three over the next few months. But let's begin with block one of this USMLE step one exam. Here we have in question one, a 27 year old male smoker with sharp stabbing sensation localized behind his right eye with tearing around that same eye and a runny nose. These, are, of course, are symptoms of cluster headache. Here we have a cartoon version which I created through AI where we see the cluster of grapes for cluster headache and that's what's going on over here. Hypothalamic activation with autonomic symptoms, i.e. cluster headache. Cluster headache equals hypothalamic activation. Quite an apropos question as I myself endure cluster headaches with pride. Anyway, the CAT scan over here as you can see is normal as the CAT scan generally is normal in cluster headache. And here I just have a chart or a table which you can find at zap70.com, actually more accurately at ajmonix.com which will be released in the next few weeks with tons of resources for the zap70 questions. Here we come Compare cluster tension and migraine headaches. All right, question two. We have a 32 year old man with low back pain, fever, and weight loss who just traveled. So if you see low back pain and fever, you always need to think about an abscess, an epidural abscess, subepidural abscess, and here there's a paravertebral abscess caused by POT, Mycobacterium tuberculosis POT syndrome. As indicated by this HIV viral load of 200,000 copies, we're dealing with an HIV patient who just traveled, most likely POT disease. And here's a little mnemonic for POT spine or POT disease. And the second P is for psoas abscess, which could possibly be what's going on over here. Actually, I just finished creating my video on mycobacterium tuberculosis, which I'll be uploading at ajmonix.com. And as we see on the back of the right screen over here, mycobacterium tuberculosis, representation of pot disease, infection of the spine. All right, question three. We have a six-year-old girl with high fever and rash, eyes are red, i.e. conjunctivitis, and the tongue is red, and she has a rash with small red bumps. This, of course, is Kawasaki disease, a medium-sized vessel vasculitis. It affects the medium-sized vessels, including the vessels of the heart, which is why patients can get an aneurysm, for example, of coronary arteries. For crash and burn on a Kawasaki, the symptoms of Kawasaki disease. All right, let's move on. Question four. Here we have a 40-year-old woman with a history of colon cancer and a strong family history of colon cancer and endometrial cancer. This is Lynch syndrome, mismatch repair gene mutation causing Lynch syndrome. And here, I just have a little summary of that. Lynch syndrome, an autosomal dominant condition with microsatellite instability represented over here in this image with this lady with a domino shirt for autosomal dominant who's holding with the Lynch, i.e. hanging, the microsatellite satellite from microsatellite instability, and she's learning about endometrial cancer because that's its association along with colorectal cancer. Let's move on. Question five. A 32-year-old man with fluctuating moods over the past two years, which is not significantly impairing his daily functioning. This is not as intense as a bipolar one, nor as a major depressive disorder. This is cyclothymic disorder. All right, cyclothymic. Here is the etymology of that word. Cycling or circling, spirit or mood, because the person has cycling moods that are not too intense to impair him significantly, but they last a very long time. All right, here's question six. 28 year old woman with pelvic pain, periods are unpredictable. She has facial hair growth and enlargement of the clitoris, clitoromegaly, unilateral ovarian mass that has both solid and cystic components and an elevated testosterone level. So this is an ovarian mass, which could be with elevated inhibin levels because this is granulosa cell tumor as indicated by the mnemonic, call granny, call for the call exner bodies, which we see in the histologic picture over here. And of course we need to, and this condition is associated with estrogen and inhibin, and this condition is associated with elevated inhibin levels and abnormal uterine bleeding, as we just mentioned. All right, question seven, a 68 year old man with tremor, stiffness, and slowness of movement. We wanna know which medication caused these Parkinsonian symptoms, and that is metoclopramide. Metoclopramide can cause these symptoms. Meto is my mnemonic that I created for this. M for moves, GI motility. E for everything in the stomach, it moves everything along. T to treat the nausea and vomiting. And O for, oh my gosh, I have tardive dyskinesia because metoclopramide can cause tardive dyskinesia. But I don't like these types of mnemonics. I prefer the visuals, which we have over here. Here we have the dope on the left of the scene because it's a dopamine receptor antagonist. We have the metal claw for metoclopramide, who is enhancing this guy's gastric motility and treating his nausea and vomiting, along with the guy in back of him who has GERD. But as we see, this guy over here has these tremors, tardive dyskinesia, and neurologic symptoms, as that's what metoclopramide could cause. Next, question eight. A 19-year-old male with fever, sore throat, and generalized malaise. Whoops, I gave it away already. Herpes virus, because this is infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus, which I wrote over here, and in the question stem, has atypical lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. And by the way, at zap70.com, along with at ajmonix.com, I explain all the wrong answer choices. So you could take a look over there if you're interested. And here we just see the atypical lymphocytes on the histology. Question nine, a 64 year old man with advanced dementia who's unable to make decisions about his medical care and the family members disagree and it's not clear who to go.
go with. So this is one of the very few situations where we need to get an ethics committee to mediate the disagreements among the family members. Usually we go with the spouse, but here apparently there is no spouse around and we're not sure which of the family members to go with. In such a situation, we'd consult an ethics committee. This is not a common answer, but in this question it is. All right, question 10. Okay, 68-year-old woman with a history of chronic stable angina, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes with nausea, fatigue, and mild shortness of breath with an elevated troponin. So which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Oh, by the way, we have an EKG over here where we see ST elevations. So this is most likely an atherosclerosis related MI. A, rupture of a coronary artery atherosclerotic plaque the pathophysiology of most MIs. And here I compare angina, vasospastic angina, and myocardial infarction, and you can get a better look at this at ajmonics.com, where you can get all the slides and review sheets. Question 11. Here we have a 55-year-old man whose tongue is smooth and beefy red, as we can see in the image, an ataxic gait, and an MCV of 110. So this is most likely vitamin B12 deficiency. Now what is vitamin B12 needed for? It's a cofactor for methionine synthase. So this is a second order question. You both have to figure out that it's vitamin B12, and you have to know that vitamin B12 is a cofactor factor for methionine synthase. And here's just a cartoon representation I had of this case. I like to have this for memory purposes. And of course, you can get this picture as well in the slides and on the review sheets. All right, let's move on. Question 12. A 19-year-old female soccer player has asymmetric septal hypertrophy and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, and she dies, unfortunately. Don't worry, it's not unfortunately. I made up this case. She didn't actually die. But this is the case over here. What is most likely to be found in autopsy? This is HOCOM, H-C-O-M, myocyte disarray and fibrosis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we could see in the septum over here histologically is defined by myocyte disarray and fibrosis. All right, question 13, a statistics question. These actually come up on the exam, many of them actually, so it's good to know them. Which statistical test is most appropriate for comparing the mean of the SBP in this question? So if you ever want to compare the means, we want to go with the independent samples t-test. All right, I have a nice little chart at ajmonics.com comparing these different tests and what they're useful for, but here we go with the independent samples t-test to compare the means. All right, question 14, a 55-year-old man, COPD and allowed single second heart sound, severe pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy, why would there be a single S2? And it's because of right ventricular failure, because in the context of severe pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy, the severe pulmonary hypertension accentuates the pulmonary component of S2. So it sounds like a single S2. All right, question 15. A five-year-old man, probably not a five-year-old man, more likely a 55-year-old man. A 55-year-old man went on this camping trip. He hiked in wooded areas and he has this particular rash on his wrinkles and ankles that spread to his trunk. I always forget the term centrifugal or centripetal, but the point is it's rickettsia and rickettsia invades endothelial cells. Here I have a little cute little picture of rickettsia on the rocky spotted mountain with the doctors on the cycles for doxycycline, the treatment for rickettsia. All right, question 16. A 67-year-old man with fatigue, weight loss, and night sweats and blurred vision with elevated IgM. So remember, this is high viscosity and the elevated IgM in Waldenstrom, and this suggests sluggish blood flow and lymphoplasmacytic infiltration in the bone marrow. That is the pathophysiology of Waldenstrom, and in this table over here, we compare Waldenstrom, multiple myeloma, and CLL. And again, you could take a look at this table at ajmonics.com. Question 17. A five-year-old boy is brought to the clinic by his parents due to difficulty breathing and a hoarse voice, and he has a small mandible, glossotosis, and a cleft palate. If you don't know what glossotosis is, don't worry. You don't need to know every word on the exam to get the question right. Additionally, the child has a history of recurrent ear infections. So this is actually a sequence, Pierre Robin sequence, affecting the first pharyngeal arch, and that's the answer to the first pharyngeal arch but the mandible should have given it away. The M's represent the first pharyngeal arch. M for maxilla, M for mandible, and M for muscles of mastication, all in the first pharyngeal arch. And here I just delineate the various arches and their associations. Question 18, a 32-year-old woman with low ferritin and high TIBC. So low ferritin is basically specific for iron deficiency anemia. It's a great question giveaway. Low ferritin is very specific for iron deficiency anemia. And of course, we see elevated TIBC. Question 19, a six-month-old boy whose hair is sparse brittle and easily broken and low serum copper, this is Menke's disease, which is an X-linked recessive condition, and patients present with what is known as, as we described here, the kinky hair, developmental delay, and can have seizures. And here's a little visual mnemonic for all of that, and I just wrote on the wall over here the ATP7A gene, that is the defective gene in Menke's disease. Question 20, seven-year-old boy with otitis media cellulitis, significantly reduced complement activity, and a defect in opsonization. So which immunoglobulin is involved in opsonization? Remember, it's IgG and C3A, so complement and C3 could be deficient, leading to these symptoms, a defect in opsonization. Here I have IgG and C3B, oh, C3B, involved in opsonization. Question 21, a 45-year-old man with FEV1 lower than predicted and FEV1 over FEC lower than predicted. This is, of course, COPD. And we're describing a case of alveolar wall destruction, i.e. emphysema. And that's what's going on in this case over here. And that explains the low oxygen saturation, the hyperinflated lungs, 
and the low values in this question. Question 22, a two-year-old boy. Irritability, loss of appetite and vomiting, his pale complexion, a bluish tint to the gums, and abdominal tenderness, these are all indicative of lead poisoning. And that makes sense, he swallowed something, and that's actually something that we can see in a two-year-old boy. For example, due to a swallowed object. And patients present with this, well, mnemonic over here, the lead lines on the gingiva, encephalopathy, abdominal colic and anemia, drops, i.e. wrist and foot drop, and sideroblastic anemia, with basophilic stippling, which we can see in the histologic picture, the basophilic stippling. By the way, I wrote in encephalopathy over here. Here's a nice trivia question. What's the difference between encephalopathy, altered mental status, and delirium? It's a great thing to think about. Encephalopathy, altered mental status, and delirium, and the answer is they're all the same. You'll probably find some nuanced differences online between the three, but in the hospital and on exams, encephalopathy, altered mental status, and delirium are all the same thing. Question 23. A 54-year-old African-American woman with blood pressure of 190 over 110, so she needs some medication to manage her resistant hypertension. What's the medication's mechanism of action? that she's going to be prescribed, direct relaxation of arterial smooth muscle because this is hydralazine. It's most likely she's given hydralazine to manage her high blood pressure, which is not responding to her medications. And you could take a look at ajmonics.com and zap70.com where I explain the wrong answer choices. Here's a little mnemonic for these medications, direct vasodilators such as hydralazine and minoxidil, dilators dilate, an awful unnecessary mnemonic, but the point is that these medications directly relax arterial smooth muscle. Question 24, a five-year-old boy who has a long face, prominent forehead, and large ears, and a mental disability, an intellectual disability. This is Fragile X, expansion of the CGG trinuclear repeat affecting the MR1 gene. And here is the visual mnemonic, which you can take a look at over here. Question 25 of his six-year-old girl with right hip pain and elevated white blood cell count. This is most likely septic arthritis caused most commonly by staph aureus clusters of gram positive cocci. Here is the visual 2D mnemonic, but I of course prefer the 3D version, which you'll find at agmonics.com, which is a Pixar style animated film, as are most of my microbiology videos. And you can take a look over there. Question 26, a seven-year-old boy, I gave it away, sorry about that, mutation in Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, Wiscott-Aldrich has a triad of thrombocytopenia, recurrent infections, and eczema. That's what's going on over here. All right, you can take a look over there. Question 27, a 68-year-old woman with a history of COPD and 40-pack year smoking history with a centrally located mass in the left lung. This, of course, is small cell carcinoma, uniform small cell to scan cytoplasm with high nuclear to cytoplasm ratio and neuroendocrine markers, small cell lung cancer. You could take a look at this chart over here. Really important to know. Remember, it's the adenocarcinoma, which is the peripherally located one, and the S is small cell lung cancer and squamous cell, which are centrally located. Question 28, a 28-year-old man with volatile anesthetic developments, muscle rigidity, and a rapid increase in body temperature attack cardiacidosis. This is malignant hyperthermia. We give dantrolene to inhibit calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You know, we have different categories of medications. Dantrolene is the exception to the muscle relaxants that we don't use it as muscle relaxant as much as we do as a malignant hypothermia treatment. Dantrolene decreases activity of normal calcium release, kind of like aspirin. Aspirin is technically a pain relieving medication, which we don't use ever for pain relief. Question 29, 14 year old boy with persistent vomiting, poor feeding lethargy, sclerosis, and liver is palpable. So this of course is galactosemia, galactose one phosphate ureteral transfer deficiency. All right, question 30. We have a 32-year-old woman. Sorry, I gave it away already again. Anaplasma. Here we see anaplasma inside the neutrophils, i.e. granulocytes. Remember, anaplasma often has to be differentiated from Ehrlichia. And I explained that at AJ Monix. You could take a look at the question and the answer. And of course, the video where I differentiate between anaplasma and Ehrlichia. Question 31. A 50-year-old woman who has dark spots on her legs, i.e. petechiae. And you could take a look at that image over here. And there's mild jaundice, low hemoglobin, and low haptoglobin, which is basically pathognomonic for a hemolytic anemia, i.e. autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which we do the Coombs test for. And 32, a nine-month-old infant with poor growth and increasing lethargy. This is homozygous deletion of beta-globin chains, beta-thalassemia. And you can take a look at the explanation over here. Question 33, a 30-year-old woman presents to her primary care physician with fatigue, muscle weakness, and a recent weight loss. She has elevated calcium levels. Sorry, I think I forgot to pick the answer over here. This is men one. We're likely going to find elevated calcitonin levels. Actually, here's the explanation. Men one, parathyroid tumors, pancreatic endocrine tumors, and pituitary tumors. And the ulcers in the jejunum was indicative of gastrinoma, a type of pancreatic endocrine tumor commonly seen in men one. 34, this is a description of multiple myeloma, reduced elevated calcium, elevated creatinine due to the kidney problems, and severe back pain, i.e. bone pain, seen in multiple myeloma. Crab demonic calcemia, renal, anemia, and bone. And here's just a little crab 
If you see the poster of multiple myeloma in the background, the crab mnemonic for multiple myeloma. 35. A 42-year-old woman with severe left calf pain and swelling. She had a sar- sharp onset chest pain and shortness of breath. And she had two spontaneous abortions, most likely anti-cardiolipid antibodies associated with antiphospholipid antibody, sy- antibody syndrome. And you could take a look at the wrong explanations again at ajmonics.com at the review sheet and the review slides. Question 36. A 16-year-old girl is brought to the clinic by her parents about her delayed puberty and lack of growth. She has a shield-shaped chest with widely spaced nipples this is most likely Turner syndrome, in which we see non-disjunction. Sorry, again, I didn't highlight it. That's choice D, because in Turner syndrome, that's caused by complete or partial absence of one chromosome, one X chromosome due to non-disjunction during meiosis or mitosis. Question 37, a three-year-old girl with frequent infections, recurrent skin abscesses, and pneumonia, and she bruises easily and has light skin, albinoism, and she has neutropenia. So this is most likely a list gene defect as seen in Shidak Higashi syndrome. That's why there are giant granules within neutrophils. All right, and I explain that over here. List gene defect leads to the impaired lysosomal trafficking, and the impaired trafficking is actually what leads to the symptomatology of the albinism, as the pigment needs to be translocated in order to provide the person with proper pigment. Question 38, a 30-year-old woman with a lesion on the cervix and enlarged lymph nodes, we want to know what's draining the area, so this is an anatomy question, the internal iliac lymph nodes, which I explain over here, and I actually have a video where I actually talk about the various lymph node drainage of the female reproductive system. Question 39, a 60-year-old woman with a splenectomy, we're going to see thrombocytosis, and that's because the spleen is responsible for filtering and removing platelets. So after a splenectomy, we're not going to have this, so there will be increase in circulating platelets, thrombocytosis. Question 40, with 35-year-old man, sorry I gave it away, we're dealing with a central diabetes insipidus question, and basically the point is that at baseline and water deprivation, in this scenario, urine osmolality will remain the same, basically, because the person doesn't have proper ADH production. But since there's a problem in production, not in the response, As long as we give desmopressin, which is the same thing as vasopressin basically, then there will be a response. So after desmopressin administration, there will be improvement in the urine osmolality because more water will be reabsorbed in the collecting duct, and that's what's going on over here, which I explain over here. All right, so this is block one. We're gonna get to block two next, and we're gonna go through the entire step one exam over here, and perhaps we're gonna cover next step two and step three. Remember zap70.com, I would love to see you there. Take care.